Um, this is uh, ending the 19th year that we've done the Gathering of Men lunches. We've got a wonderful team of hosts at host tables, and some have hosted it all 19 years. We've had new people all the way along that have uh, Brent brought their friends. We've had um, some amazing thing hap things happen in the lives of people over the years. I had a little 30-minute talk and a one-hour luncheon. So we appreciate you guys, especially that are host. Appreciate you fellows that uh, take up uh, the offer that you're extended to be here. And um, I think well over 40,000 men have come to this luncheon over the last 19 years from all over the city. Very excited about that. And, you know, I wish we had a gathering at about 10 different locations in DFW. If anybody wants to start one and help us to put it together, we would, we would be glad to give you some instructions of how we do that. It's very simple, but we'd love to be located all over the Metroplex and reach men that don't know Christ. Hey, how you doing? So also, uh, I want to make one more quick uh, announcement. I am doing this Saturday at Dallas Seminary. We've been sending notices out, a uh, summit. We call it a disciple-making summit. It'll go from 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. We've got students. We've got men like yourself. We've got some uh, leaders around the area. I've got a buddy and a friend of his flying in from Virginia that will be with us. Uh, if you have not read about this and you could still make the time to do it, what we do is we give an overview of the biblical mandate to make disciples and all the, the intricacies of that. And so when you, once you get that under your belt, you will be pretty much prepared to do what Jesus said to do in Matthew 28 when he said, go make disciples. So last time, uh, series, we had these little things to sign up on the table if you uh, didn't sign up or would like to sign up, I know it's football day, it's Saturday, uh, but I'm going to be there missing my other stuff that I normally do teaching. If you want to grab one of these, I'll leave them right down here. It tells you how to sign up and you can do that. Okay, um, a lot of you in this room, uh, not all of you, but a lot of you know that Brian Dunnigan, pastor of Highland Park Press, 44 years old, uh, this past week... Um, went to be with the Lord unexpectedly. Brian was a good friend of mine. I didn't know him perhaps as well as some of you did, but we knew each other, and he was always very uh, uh, cooperative and eager for this gathering to meet at Highland Park Press, which we did for years until they started the construction process, and then we moved here, and we've not moved back there yet, but so, so wonderful. Uh, that we were hosted like that, but what a man he was. I've had people send me notes, explain that to me. Why would, why would the Lord yank somebody up at 44 years old? Well, first of all, God didn't yank him up. Nothing is done by accident. God is in control. Do I understand it all? Absolutely not. And we all have perhaps in our own families, and our own lives, and I certainly do, Loved ones who would have gone at different uh, times and stages of their lives from being very young, from being just out of the womb to 21 years old to my own wife. So I understand a little bit about that, but there's still a mystery about it. But the big thing I want to say today is two things. Number one, uh, I loved Brian. And for those of you that were, are a part of Highland Park Press, he loved you. The second thing is I want you to be praying for Allie, his wife, Annie, Wheeler, and Collier, uh, Jane. That's what breaks my heart, to see that little family left. I know there are a lot of people brown, a lot of people bringing food and all that stuff. Let me tell you when somebody really needs you. After this afternoon at 3 o'clock, in the weeks ahead, in the months ahead, that's when somebody that lost a loved one needs some people. I'm praying for them being available to do whatever. And I know some of you have already done a lot to make a difference even in the last few days. So let's just take a moment, and if you'll remember those four people that I mentioned, Allie, Annie, Wheeler, and Collier, Jane, and just in your own way, pray for that family and pray for this afternoon for the witness that will be made for Jesus Christ through the life of Brian Dunnigan. So let's take a moment and pray.
In Jesus' name, amen. Fellow, we never, we never know, fellows, when it's going to be our time. You never know. Today could be the day for some of us. Um, I've lived way past what I thought I was going to live, and I'm going to keep going as long as I can, doing what I do. But if Brian could give us a message right now, I think he would say, get your mind right, make sure you're understanding what this life's all about, what Jesus is all about, what he expects from you, don't waste your time, get after it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite movies of all time, maybe some of yours, is a movie called Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman. And I was going to put a couple, I know which scene you're remembering in there too, if you know what I'm talking about. So, mm -hmm. so uh, there was a scene in there, and we were going to put it on the screen, but it didn't come off the internet real clearly, so we're just, I'm just going to tell you what it is. So Paul Newman, Luke, the character Luke, three or four times tries to escape from this camp where he is. And so they always catch him, they always bring him back. And the old boss is up on the, the porch at that old house, and there's Luke standing in chains after they retrieve him. And the old boss looks out and he said, Luke, what we got here is a failure to communicate. That's one of my favorite, but that's not the line I want to use. Then another time he comes in, the old boss gets up, he said, Luke, let me tell you, son, you got to get your mind right. Then one of the last times they made him get in the center of this prison camp and dig a hole. And he was down about probably four or five feet. It's nighttime. Uh, the guy that rides the horse with the shotgun, the glasses, you can't see his eyes. He's standing up there, and he looks down at Luke, and Luke's just crying, man. He has been digging and digging in that hot sun. Now it's the evening. He hadn't had anything to eat, and the old boy looks down. And he said, Luke, is your mind right now? Is your mind right? I can't tell you how critical it is with the subject we're going to talk about today to make sure we're thinking right. The book of Proverbs says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So how we think about the issues and the critical things of life is really important. And so we're going to dig in. Someone said this. Actually, I know who it was. It was a man named Chesterton in 1925. And I find some of the best quotes, some of the best thoughts come from old timers years ago. Men that really were thorough thinkers. This is what he said. He said, there comes an hour in the afternoon. When the child is tired of pretending, when he's weary of being a robber or a cowboy, it's then that he torments the cat. And the point is, what do we do in the afternoon? And I've talked to more men uh, as I've looked at them and observed them and watched them over the years, and I've said, you're bored, aren't you? When we're bored, we do crazy things. We do, we st we do stuff... That's not right. That's not healthy. But he goes on to say, there comes a time in the routine of an ordered civilization when the man or woman is tired of playing at mythology and pretending that the tree is a maiden or that the moon made love to a man. The effect of this staleness is the same everywhere. It is seen in all drug taking and every form of the tendency to increase the dose. Men seek stranger sins or more startling obscenities as stimulants to their jaded senses. They seek after mad exotic religions for the same reason. Then they try to stab their nerves to life as if it were with the knives of the priest of Baal. They are walking in their sleep and they try to wake themselves up with nightmares. And boy, is that current in the day and the time in which we're living today. So one of the questions as we begin today is this. So uh, who are you, who am I as a man? Now, if you look at our culture today, there might be people walk in and out of here, yank out my microphone and say, well, you're not a man, you're a woman, or you're something else. I mean, you never know the craziness that you're going to hear. But let me ask you the question, as a man, who are you? Where'd you come from? Why are you here? Where are you going? Those are key questions. 
But here are some of the things people in our culture say. As a man walks down a lonely road between two hospitals, he's born in one and dies in another. Science tells him he's a blob of protoplasm. Psychology likens him to a rat running through a maze. Philosophy ties him to, and, and tries to give him reason for running through the maze. Historians tell him about his past. Statisticians tell him about his future. But after they finish their little speeches, the meaningless of their words is matched only by the meaninglessness of his own death. So where do you find meaning and purpose in life? Where do you find a reason, uh, reasons to answer those questions? Who are you? Where would you come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Etc. So that's what I want to dig into today, and here we go. So if you look at the screen, I want you to suppose that a young man decided one day he was going to do a little mountain climbing. So he goes out and he begins to go up the side of that mountain, and a lot of you have probably done a lot of mountain climbing. I've got friends that have been up Everest. I've got, they've been all over the world climbing mountains. But in the illustration, let's, let's think. Can we put that up there, please? Here you go. Just imagine that just before he gets to the top, his foot slips. He reaches out in desperation, and there's a root, a protruding root sticking out. And so here's, here's, as I look at that, here's what I'm thinking. Well, what's going to happen? Well, number one, either he's going to give out and just keep, get weary and tired and let go, or the root will break, or the other option is, or possibility is, somebody's going to come along and offer to help. Now, the question becomes, what kind of help does he need? Any kind of help, just any old kind of help won't work. So he needs, first of all, I think, adequate help. Number two, he needs immediate help. So how about his position philosophically? Well, there are a lot of different philosophies floating around. You know, maybe he's an existentialist. You know, this is your existential moment, and right here you are, and this is it. Or maybe he's a fatalist, or maybe he's a determinist. Maybe he's even a man of faith. But nonetheless, he's hanging there. So let's, let's suppose help will come. What will determine when help comes whether he will let go or not? Let's suppose for a second that it's an old coach from high school. This is the coach that always ran him extra up the, up the, the stadium steps or more wind sprints, never let him play. He thought he should play. And the old coach looks over and says, hey, Johnny, there you are down there. Let go. I'll be glad to help you. What he thinks about that coach is going to determine whether he lets go or not. Or let's, let's pretend it's, an, I can remember in my school, my English teacher. This guy was a nice guy, but he wasn't a good teacher. And I had a class full of people, including me, that we liked to disrupt the class. And so right, every time he turned around and turned his back to the class and write something on the board, we had spitballs ready. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, they're just pelting him. He'll turn around and say, cut it out with not a lot of energy when he said that. But anyway, if he's looking over and said, well, John, just let go. I'll hold you. He ain't gonna, he ain't, I'm not going to let go. I can't trust that guy. Let's suppose it's a little scout. And he's out on a search and destroy mission with his troop. He weighs about 85 pounds. The guy hanging on to the root weighs about 185. And he leans over. He's got a good heart, good intention. He said, let go. I'll help you, mister. I'll help you. Because uh, that would be two greasy spots on the ground. So the point is, whether he lets go or not, is it adequate and is it immediate? So, faith. Many people say <clears throat> that faith... It's a number of things, but at least it's an intellectual suicide. If you have faith, especially in this God thing, in this Jesus thing, you're just cashing in your brain. You're not a thinking person. Lewis Carroll, one of my favorite writers in a little piece called Through the Looking Glass, in this little piece, if you've seen it, there is an instructive dialogue between Alice and the White Queen. Here's how it goes. How old are you? 
the queen asks. Well, I'm seven and a half. Exactly. You need it to be exactly. I can believe it without that. Now, I want you to give you something to believe. I'm 105 months in one day. And Alice protests. I can't believe that. Can't you? Try again, the queen says. Take a long breath. Shut your eyes. And Alice just roars. There's no use trying. I can't believe, she says, impossible things. To which the queen responds, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was your age, I always did it for about a half hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. The average person says today, when we talk about faith, they just say, well, you're just saying close your eyes and take the jump and just believe. I remember years ago, I was at a conference with, I was speaking at with about 3,000 students up in the mountains of North Carolina, and the music team that was playing at the end of the talk, this is what they said over and over and over again. Believe, just believe, just believe, just believe. Then they started again. Just believe, just believe in what? Believe in what? And so a thinking person often thinks, well, you don't have anything to believe in. What's the basis of the belief? Someone said this. It was a father, I think, who said, talking to his son, asked him one day, he said, what uh, do you think having faith means? The boy responded quickly and said, faith is believing what I know isn't true. Now, if we're honest, if you're a seeking person today looking for something to believe and you've kind of pushed away this God stuff, Jesus stuff, Bible stuff, church stuff, um, you need to listen to this. If you think you have a relationship with the Lord, you need to listen to to see if you, how deep and significant in your life, the core of your very being, your belief really is. So, why is it so difficult to believe? I believe that faith is only as valid as the object of your faith. So, if I'm going to if I'm going to launch out in this area of faith and the Christian faith, then I got to know what is the object of the faith. So let me give you a definition of faith or commitment. It's the moment-by-moment moment giving of as much as I know about myself to as much as I know about God. Now, if I don't have the right thinking, if I don't have my mind right, if I don't have the right thinking about the God of the universe, about this person called Jesus, the Son of God, if I, don't have, if I have erroneous thinking, for example, here's erroneous thinking. And this is what happens when in Christian organizations and churches, we do not disciple people individually and raise them up to be thinking and well-equipped. So if you hear a Christian say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. That's what I choose to be. But any religion is okay because they all lead to God. No, they don't. That's a lie from the pit of hell. But that's what happens when we are not maturing and growing and somebody taking us on, answering our questions, and giving us a firm faith foundation to live by, to stand on, and to give to others. So... What we're really talking about here is, what is your concept of God? If you just thought for a minute, and if you went through some of the difficult things that maybe you've gone through or will go through, by the way, they do come. They do come. And maybe you didn't understand the difficult things, the loss, whatever, that you went through, and that can begin to impact your concept of God. Well, I thought God really cared, but apparently He doesn't. Or maybe He can't do anything, et cetera, et cetera. So listen to this, and then we're going to build on this. Your concept of God will determine your commitment to Him. If you don't have the proper concept of God, then your commitment's like it's probably going to be pretty weak or even non-existent. So, I believe a lot of people, including myself over the years, have had misconceptions about God. Let me give you a few of them. One, there's what I call the Australian view. 
Now, there are a group of Australian Aborigines that believe God is a 20-mile-long green snake. Now, I don't know about you, but I couldn't get too fired up about giving my life over into the hands of a group of people that believe in a 20-mile-long green snake. But you get the point. Your concept of God will determine your commitment to Him. Or here's another one. You know, and this actually happened to me. I used to work with a company called IMG, International Management Group, the founder of it. I don't mention this a lot, but he's dead now, and it's way in the past. But a guy named Mark McCormick started it with Gary Player, Jack Nicholas, and Arnold Palmer. And I did a lot of work undercover with athletes all over the world that were struggling and going through problems. And I was trying to get Mark to Jesus. I remember we were sitting at breakfast. And I, I had done everything I could to explain as clearly as I could over many months who Jesus was, why you need him, how to get to know him, how to establish that relationship. And he still was balking. Now, let me tell you why people balk. And I won't, this is, doesn't necessarily apply to Mark. They don't, want to, they don't want to give up control. I want to run my own life. I got a little hanky-panky going on over here, man. You know, I got to give all that. I mean, well, I don't, who wants to do that? I'll get in at the end. You know, right at the end, I'll slide on in. Well, you might get a raw tail sliding in on that. Yeah, that may be too late. So God will make me weird. And I said to Mark, I said, Mark, let me ask you a question. I said, do you know some Christians, people who claim to be Christians, and they're weird, and you think if you give your life to Jesus to follow him, he's going to make you weird? He said, yes. I said, well, let me inform you about something. There are some people that, who are Christians that are weird, but I want you to know something. When you get to know the real Jesus, he will not make you weird. That person is already weird before they come to Jesus. <laughs> and there are, there are some weird people. And bless them, they're going to bless their hearts. They're going to be with Jesus. But daggone it, they're weird. They came out weird. Here's another one. God is trivial. And what that means is of little value or importance. I don't need this God stuff. I'm doing just fine. I got a few ups and downs and a few bumps here and there. But, you know, it's, this God thing's trivial. Here's another one. God doesn't fit the system. Listen, we're living in 2023 or a sophisticated society. Yeah, check that one out again, how sophisticated we are. Dying by degrees. Here's another one. You know what? I bet some of these Christians, I think, I don't, they never smile. They never laugh. I don't know what, unless they have a, a lot to drink. I mean, they, they ain't a whole lot of joy in them. I mean, I think God's a killjoy. I think he sucks all the fun out of you. I don't think you'll be able to have a whole lot of lightheartedness if you get a hold and this God killjoy, God gets a hold of you. That's another thought. Let me tell you, another one says God is a heavenly janitor. So here's God on cloud number 22. And something tragic happens in your life. And you pray, dear God, please help me put my life back together again. And he just, he said, listen, pat you on the butt and says, you know, everything's going to be okay. Get back in there and get after it. He's just a heavenly janitor trying to put a little glue on the pieces and trying to put us back together and maintain us and keep us going. To some people, God is only for the needy. And if you don't see a neediness, then you don't need him. But you can have a need and not know it. Think about that. You can have a need and not know it. So my first wife uh, came into uh, my office in Jackson, Mississippi years ago. She had had routine checkup. She was like 28, 29 years old. And she sat down and she started to weep. And she said, the doctor just told me that I am a diabetic and I have to start taking these shots. And she went in there and was feeling great, sleeping great, energetic, raising our kids. Didn't think anything was wrong. No need. But she had a deadly disease which eventually took her life. You can have a need and not know it. Some people believe God's a great old grandfather in the sky, giving suckers away to kids. Oh, everything's going to be okay. Just come on, I love you. Sit up on daddy's lap. We'll rock a little bit. Some people believe 
that God is only for old people. So if you're old, and some of you are old, <laughs> and your grandkids look at you, and they hear you talk about going to church and reading your Bible and loving Jesus, well, that's what old people do. I'm alive. Man, I've got vigor and energy, and I'm thinking, and I'm hopping and bopping and moving. Let me read a little verse from, a couple verses here from the, a book in the Bible that sounds like a modern-day newspaper. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, Solomon, the wealthiest, brightest, most intelligent man who had ever lived on the planet, tried everything there was to fill the hole in his life, and this is what he says about old people. Four, there will come a time when your limbs will tremble with age, your strong legs will become weak, and your teeth will be too few to do their work, and there will be blindness too. Then let your lips be tightly closed while eating when your teeth are gone, and you will awaken at dawn with the first note of the birds, but you yourself will be deaf and tuneless with a quavering voice. You will be afraid of heights and of falling, a white-haired, withered old man dragging himself along without sexual desire, standing at death's door, nearing his everlasting home as the mourners go by the streets." There you go. Is that, so is that it? Is that it? Well, that is it. That's what's going to happen to all of us to one degree or another. I don't care how much you work out, how many trainers you got, how many detoxes you go on, eventually it's going to catch up with your butt. But that doesn't mean it has to be the end. Doesn't mean you have to go through this life looking at that or be even in that right now and be depressed. So... What is God like then? That's what we're after, the concept of God. What is God like? Let me give you a statement, then I'm going to read a couple passages. Here it is. God is like, you ready? God is like Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, then get to know what Jesus is like. That's why God put skin on and came to the planet because he wanted you to understand what a holy God looked like. And a holy God cannot hang out with unholy people. That's us. And somehow, some way, he had to communicate his character and who he was and what he was like. And so as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament about Jesus, it will tell you what he's like. So let's look at one passage. Let's look at uh, Colossians. And I think you'll see it on the screen. Listen to this one. He is the image, this is talking about Jesus, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him, by him and for him. That's, part, that's you and me created by him, for him. Are you living for his purposes? <clears throat> and he is the head of the body, the church, believers. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have pre supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness, all of who he was, dwell in him, Jesus. And through Jesus, to reconcile himself all things on the planet were the things on earth and heaven by making peace through what he did on the cross, his blood shed on the cross. Just one of the little passages that deals with who this person Jesus was. A real person who lived, who died. If you would have been there when he was on the cross, if you would have run your hand across that cross, you would have gotten a splinter in it. It really happened. It's not just a Sunday school story lived, died, and rose from the dead, went back to be with the fathers, coming again someday, like he says he is. They say, well, he didn't come the first time. Yeah, he did. There is abundant evidence, apart from the Bible, that Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead. Have you done your research? You see, once, once the, the factualness of the facts about Jesus dawn on us, like a friend, I was talking to a buddy this morning in Gainesville, Florida, and he works with a buddy of mine. Actually, I can't wait to see him next week. He's one of the development guys for the University of Florida Gators. And what a neat guy he is. He said, well, you know, Fleetwood came. Fleetwood, is that a great name? 
Fleetwood Fleming. That may be the greatest name I've ever heard in my life. I've met this guy before. He's going to be in my office at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. I can't wait to see him. He said, Fleetwood came in the other day, and he said, we've been meeting and talking about Jesus, and he loves Jesus, but he's, he, said, he said, Scott, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm getting it and understanding why this is so important. I want to give my life to him fully, completely, unreservedly. So if you look at John chapter 14, verse 7, if you really knew me, Jesus said, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. If you've seen Jesus, he was telling these people when he was there in the flesh, you've seen God. That was one of his claims. So either he was lying or telling the truth. So how do, how do we then begin to understand this Jesus? Well, you've got to get to know him in the Gospels. And as you get to the exposure in his manual of operation, he will begin to impress upon your heart and mind who he really is. So you might want to read through the first 11 chapters of the Gospel of John sometime. And you'll read all these miracles that he did. John chapter 2, he turned the water to wine. John 4, he heals a nobleman's son who's 20 miles away, and he heals him from 20 miles distance. And John 5, he, he, the cripple at the pool, he says, get up and walk. We all are crippled, by the way. John 6, he feeds 5,000 people with a handful of crumbs. Actually, there were more than 5,000 because they didn't number the women in that number there were and children. There were close to 20,000. Why was he doing all this stuff? If you go to John 9, he heals a man blind from birth. John 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. Why did he do all that? If you go to John, if you know your Bible, if you go to John in chapter number 20, verse 30 and 31, now and Jesus did many other signs or miracles in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. He did more than I mentioned. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So through his words and his works, he then and today through the book is trying to convince us who he is. So the question I would ask you is, are you convinced? Now, for you who know Christ, you need to take notes now so you can help other people know how to know him. If you don't know him, you're going to know how to know him right now. So number one, we need to see the problem which we're going to put on the board with the illustration. The scripture says that, and again, Romans 3.23, fall of sin and come short of the glory of God. No man on the earth has a right relationship with a God. We're all inflicted with this disease called sin. There's something in you and me that causes you and me to want to do what you and me want to do. As a result of that, in Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin is death. The reason we have to die someday is because of the disease. So the question then becomes, is there any hope? That goes to the next diagram. 2,000 years ago, God put skin on, sent his son down, God in a body, put him on the cross, and he said, the wages that you are due, my son's going to take on that cross. He's going to die the death that John Tolson is due to die. He's going to take the penalty. And let me just stop here and say, there is no religion on the earth that offers this. Don't get sucked into belief. Well, we just need to be tolerant. You know, some of us are so daggone broad-minded, we bend over, our brains fall out. All religions are not the same. I'm not putting down the people that follow those religions, but they are alive from the pit of hell. And we better get that straight. And what you see going on in the evil side of the Middle East from a certain group of people right now that are attacking the world literally and what they believe, it ain't what we're talking about here. So if you kill an infidel, guess what you get? You get to go whatever they call the heaven, and you're going to have seven virgins, and you can have sex around the clock. Isn't that great? That's stupid. That's what you get. 
There's no answer for the sin problem in any religion of the world. None. Just be good and do the best you can. So the scripture says in Romans 10, 9, it says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, in other words, he is who he claimed to be, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified or made right with God, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved or have a right relationship with God. Or if you look in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And in Acts 238, it says, as a part of saying you believe that he did what he did, you also have to repent. Now, that's something we leave out. Guys like me that want men so desperately to come Jesus. The Bible tells us that we not only need to acknowledge him and our sin, but we need to repent. You say, what the heck does that mean? That sounds like that Baptist language. No, that's Bible language. Let me tell you what it means to repent. It means to change your mind. It means I'm going this way. I come to know Christ, and I say, I am repenting, Lord. I, want to, I am changing my mind to how I'm going to live. I'm going this way, your way. The Bible says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me if you want to be my disciple. How are you doing on that one? Go to Matthew 7. And Jesus says, some of you someday are going to come to me. Well, I, 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 I belong to that Baptist church or that Episcopal church or whatever that church was. And, and I did went on trips and mission trips. And I, I, I helped people, uh, you know, with their teeth over there that didn't have any dental care. I did give money. That He said, I never knew you. I never knew you. It wasn't all the stuff that you did I was looking for. What I was looking for that you had unreservedly changed your mind and given yourself to me. And you said, I want to follow you even though it's a process and you won't be perfect in this life. I made up my mind. I am going to follow Jesus. Have you done that? Have you done that? You say, what happens when you do that? Look at Romans 8, 1. Therefore, when Christ comes in your life, there is now no more, no condemnation. He is not going to hold over your head a big bear, a big block and said, hey, one false move and boom, down she comes. You will never, he, there's a great verse in, 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 in Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far as the Lord removed our sin from us. I used to try to figure that out. Then one day my wife came to me. She said, I figured out what it means. Because I said, well, if God knows everything, how can he forget that? She said, here's the answer. He refuses, once he forgives you, to ever bring it up again. He's not going to wave it in front. Hey, don't you remember last year, last week, the other night? It's gone. Now let me tell you what motivates guys like us once we get it, once we get the importance of what has been done for us, that there's no other answer, then we stand in line before him. Every morning we get up and we salute and say, Lord, I'm your man today. What do you want? What do you want? Those kind of commitments change the planet. Pygmy faith changes nothing. Weak faith changes nothing. So I have to ask, and I'm asking you to ask yourself, how are you doing with all that? Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's no other way. Now here's a, here's a warning for you. Many men believe in this city and other places too that all i got to do is get my ticket punched, accept Jesus, And I'm set, and then I just go do what I want to do. No, that's step one. Step two in all succeeding steps are to grow, mature, and develop and follow him. Ardently, passionately, becoming a man of the book, becoming a man that gets on his knees and prays, becoming a man that lives out his agenda every day of my life. That's what he's calling for. That's the kind of faith that will change the planet. That would change Dallas. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Let's go up to the next one, please. If that's your life, and I've just explained to you Jesus and what he did, is he in you or outside of you? 
You, you get no relationship with God through Jesus unless he is in your life. And the only way he gets in, he doesn't barge his way in. He won't manipulate you. He says, you just got to say thank you, admit you're a sinner, repent, say I'm going to change my mind and go the different direction. He says, you believe that? You give me that kind of thing? I want to come in your life and I'm going to begin to change you. If you don't have him in there today, it's be a good time to do it. If you have him in there, then ask yourself, how am I doing with following him day by day, moment by moment? Got to make a decision. Well, my time's up. So I had a couple good illustrations, but let's pray. Well, Lord, thank you for, um, thank you for the truth of your book, which helps us to understand what you're like, how much you love us, what your heart is for us, what you've done for us through your Son. Everything we've needed, you have provided. So, Lord, if there are guys here today that need to have you in, just help them right now on their own. Just say, Jesus, I need you. Come in. Clean me up. I need you. Help me to learn to follow you. And for those of us who need to begin to develop and grow, and we've just kind of been playing at this game of following Jesus, I pray that we'll take the steps, get the help we need to begin to really follow you and allow you not only to change us inside, but on the outside we'll begin to live a different life. We'll begin to make a difference for you. And so, Jesus, thank you again. Thank you. We can never, never say it enough. Thank you. Now, I want to tell you something before I close. In this city, there used to be a man who was my friend, and he was in a well-known church in Dallas, a big church. One time, a man came to him, a very influential man who went to that church, a very wealthy man, and he looked at the preacher, my friend, and he said, why do you always have to talk about Jesus? Friend, there is nothing else to talk about. Have a good week. See you next week.